Welcome to the Stories Are Soul Food podcast, presented by Cannonball Books, the kids' fiction imprint of Cannon Press. Met a ghost of a king on the road when I first fell. Fire burning to my knees, to my knees I fell. Met a ghost of a king on a road. And here we are, another melodious episode of Sasf <laughs> incoming. We back. <laughs> episode 109. There we go. 100 and ninth yep. episode of Sasf. Uh, in which we, of course, will be completely groundbreaking, establish entirely new conversations. Well, this is actually an episode where I'm going to try and get us and to- And finally grow up as a podcast. To be really rude. Oh, great. So let's see what we can do. Okay, we're going to be rude. This is a, this is a, well, this is the part of SAS that people don't like. They say that you shouldn't have such strong opinions. So here's, who's, who, who is they? Dude, when every time anyone says they, it's not a real person. <laughs> who are these jokers? <laughs> this is the one star reviews on our podcast because no one could dislike it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's funny is, uh, I don't know. I, I developed or just was born with a complete immunity to reviews. So yeah, it's helpful. Yeah, I am not, but I, I so you can, hurt, <laughs> you can cut me. You can cut me with your reviews. I, I, the first, my first ever book tour, I remember doing a, a book festival somewhere, some state or other. I know I was in the United States. I don't know where it was, but I was at this festival of authors and a theme emerged that would show up often i was uh it showed up in la like this big like man i wish i could remember who's, who sponsored these things but like an la times you know target mm. book festival whatever showed up on the east coast where authors would talk about reviews that they'd poured over oh okay i'm kidding i don't mind and you can hate anything the number of authors who've told me that they have wept <gasps> Straight up wept. Yeah. <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> yes. Yuck is the response. And I was just thinking like, oh my gosh. Like, and then on the flip side of that, the other authors who would tell me that they would save like especially great five-star reviews. So the flattery. And would just, you know, in the morning would just read them and like when they were feeling down, would go back and read them. And I was like, oh my gosh. Well, this I is believe Clay Thompson does watch his own highlights. That's what I read. <laughs> he has the video guys put together his game six or his third yeah, quarter. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. He, he watches that when he needs to get back in. No, so. I, I can. So that makes sense to me when you need to, because a shooter needs to feel it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, and you, and psychologically, there's a, a ton of like, yeah, getting into that. I, that makes more sense to me because watching film on yourself when yeah. you're an athlete makes sense. <laughs> if it's just fawning, if he had a highlight reel of just talking heads on shows talking about how amazing he was mm -hmm. or just talking heads talking about how terrible he was those are the weird things and plenty of people do that you know the <laughs> the michael jordan thing he, t he took it personally and i was, took that and i personally. took that personally <laughs> um but it's yeah anyway so no, i didn't i didn't know that there were reviews of stories or soul food or that was a thing well, that could be reviewed how dare we, people we should review offer. us? We should offer. You can put, it has to be five star, obviously, but you can put your worst thing we've said on the show or <laughs> your best thing we've said on the show. How about I promised a weep on the show while reading a five star review? <laughs> <laughs> See if you can, Nate. Make, make me Nate. weep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who cares what other people think about you on the internet? That's crazy. Well, I don't know how it helps me get better. So, right. You know, I, I think if you review work that say we've done and we had a problem with it and you identified a problem we didn't know, we'll say thank you. Yeah. If you've identified a well, problem. Maybe. We'll think about it. Yeah. In, they... in my head, I'd say, hey, you got it. I missed that. That was a problem. But also, like, if it's something we did know and there's a strategic reason for it, then I, I don't this, care. This comes back to sports because one of my happiest moments as a writer came when I had my first book deal. My first manuscript came back covered in editorial. Mm. I mean, just man crawling. Yeah. Page one of Lee Pike Ridge. Just, I mean, the, the sheer volume. Awesome. Blew my mind. And it was thrilling, like looking at it because yeah. my parents had done an amazing job reading everything I wrote. And like, if I wanted them to read something and give me thoughts, they did every time didn't matter if i was in grad school whenever it would just be like hey mom dad you know i'm sending you something would you mind giving me thoughts 
And through high school and college, they had a lot of thoughts. You know, mm -hmm. I got a lot of notes back. And then it started getting to the place where I wouldn't get notes and I would give it to other people and try to get notes. And yeah, it was just like, okay, how do I get my game better? How do I, yeah, how do I go from where I am to the next level? And it was You've like leveled up, yeah, fiction into to where you're above amateurs. I was, yeah, I was sort of, <laughs> but I wasn't professional. You right. know, I was like, I was right. still, I was just still somebody trying to figure it out. Yeah. But everybody around me who'd been really supportive and helpful was, would basically just say, good job. Yeah. And like very, I appreciated it. I appreciated yeah. them reading it, but it was rare, rarely. And my dad would have great questions. My mom would have questions. There'd be like clarification questions, but they wouldn't be like slashing the line level, the sentence level. Yeah. And, you know, really, really refining my actual prose craft at that level. And so when I finally sold a book and Lee Pike showed up and that man, Jim Thomas, my editor, uh, he was fantastic, just brutalized it. I mean, just brutalized Dude, it to the point where I what was, yeah, I was really shocked yeah, and thrilled and sitting there, like I, I still have it. I saved that thing forever and it's awesome. But that moment was like, oh man, like, yes, like this, this is because is this is what I needed. I needed that kind of resistance. It'll make me yeah. better. So I'm a big fan of criticism right. that will make you better. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> one of the worst parts about grad school, not at New St. Andrews was just everybody's kid glove handling of everybody else's work um, right no one ever you know at the there camp, will be no camper negativity. down camper down they're happy to slash into you oh yeah <laughs> um, yes. but uh at uh, you know not being willing to tell someone where their work failed yep is it's not terrible. working here no, in fact there. the only people who got that was poets because i think people on a line could say oh that didn't really work but fiction everyone was like that's great or yeah. I'm, I'm not sure you know that sort of feedback yeah so that the, I love criticism that actually takes a product. You're trying to make something great. My, my older sister w was great at this too. She was a really talented artist and I had an artist's eye without any artistic ability. So I had, I could see it. I could see what was wrong with stuff. I could process that pretty quickly, but I had no ability to paint it or draw it. And I'm completely lacking talent there. Um, by comparison, you know, by comparison to her, but she would come to me with drawings and paintings all the time. Mm. Be like, what? Why can't see it? Like something's off. Mm. Like something's off. What is it? And I could tell her, and it was never sensitive. You know, it was. Yeah. You know, I would just tell her what was wrong, and I couldn't do anything about it. And then I discovered that uh, the editorial gifts are like that. There's yeah. a lot of editors who can write prose themselves, but they don't. Right. But most of the really talented editors, the really, really gifted fiction editors are people who do not have the ability mm -hmm. <laughs> to do it themselves. They have the eye and the instinct. Yeah. Something. And we say that a lot. To just rip yours and be like, this is inefficient. This is yeah. stupid. I, rem I remember the first time I hit a note where he, he said, you've used this sentence construction three times across two and a half pages. And I was like, that's real. That's was a like, real level. Like, yeah. okay. Like, <laughs> fair cop. Wow. Like, I can't believe you noticed that. And you're right. I do, I yeah. do have this clausal instinct. You know, one particular um, arrangement of descriptive modifiers that he would catch that I would, I would slip into. I still love it, but it, it was, uh, you know, the, yeah, the, it's just something the you, frequency. Yeah. You default to <laughs> the, it. The, frequ the frequency was one that he was complaining about. And it was, but his eyeballs, like his awareness, his yeah. instinct, and what he was able to see about what I was writing that I didn't see. Well, I still had words and sentences coming out just because that's what was coming out. And he, he taught me. He was the one who taught me how to discipline every single line and every well, single phrase. Isn't it sad that current students don't get that grammar knowledge to be yeah. able to even identify that level? Like they, yeah. they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be on the lookout or even to be able to describe what is right. going on here? This yep. you have a clause here that's the same. Well, yeah, you know, even that level of what is a clause? <laughs> <laughs> you know? well, yeah, too many people are going to be like, ah, oh, so, it's like a phrase. All that to say is, I'm a f real fan of criticism because criticism makes you better, yeah. even when it's wrong. Totally. So, editor, there are times when he would tell me, like, he would circle a paragraph or something, be like, delete. Yeah, and I would 
think, man, no, that was really essential to what I was trying to accomplish. But him telling me to delete it tells me that I've it's failing. Totally. Like it's not doing its job. And so it would turn into two and a half pages. It would go from like one paragraph to a section. Yeah. And a good editor's not gonna say, hey, you did the opposite of what I said. Correct. They're gonna understand. Yeah. Oh, you got it. Yeah. Uh, and so the and sometimes he'd push back and be like, hey, I now I see it, reduce this though, you know, lean it out, mm -hmm. make it more efficient. But there was this back and forth of like he was he was hunting weaknesses and flaws yeah. and hairline fractures in anything I was doing. And that was an amazing experience. People who review your book on the internet, you know, they can they can crucify you because they they don't like middle grade. Yep. You know, you can you can end up with a, a one star review because you're like, I hate fantasy. And you're like, then why did you read my book? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, the good readers <clears throat> don't always have the right judgment. Yeah. Surprise, so if right? you have thousands and thousands of reviews over a bunch of books, you you have to be completely immune. Yeah. To the positive and the negative. Some of my very favorite, this is good for anybody who's still sensitive to reviews, teach a class and then read the student feedback. <laughs> and those are hilarious. Yeah. You can just get every insult known to man couched, not meaning to be an insult. And that's, yeah. that's great. I love those. Those are my favorite. Yeah. No, that's, that's the re evaluations are, are good, but consumer evaluations are frequently wild. Yeah. We talked about that last episode with, uh, um, you know, Slumdog Millionaire, how yeah. a studio will look at and evaluate yeah. success and get the absolute wrong lesson. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And people do that too. Oh yeah. Almost always. Uh, we all, we, we all have a tendency to try to like protect ourselves and our egos and, mm -hmm. and how we process failure. Um, yeah. So I really do. I, one of my, my first conversations with John Irwin, um, the director, that made me like him a ton was he was, he was talking about the film Woodlawn, which mm. um, a lot of people really, really love, but it failed in the box office. And in talking to him about it, he's like, man, after that, I spent a couple months just processing everything, going through deep diving, everything about our business model, our financial model, our release strategy, like everything, everything about it. And he kind of wrote himself like a Jerry Maguire, uh, you know, memo mm. uh, for, for what happened. He said, because there's a word for what happened and the word is failure. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> and he said, awesome. a lot of people try to, they, they spend a yeah. ton of time trying to find a way to have it not have failed. It wasn't a failure really, you know, it's yeah. like there's ways in which, so none of my books failed. <laughs> you know, it's like right. nothing ever well, failed. One, nothing I touched failed. Uh, this one is a success in a limited area of the market. It, yeah, this one is like, you know, it, it's funny. It's funny how how much people do that. And so when John just said that one was a failure, and I had to, I spent months trying to learn every single thing I could from that failure. I was like, I like you. That's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yep. There's a lot of amazingly positive reviews of Woodlawn. Yeah, like he could have just gone and read those and. But the actual marketplace goals that he had for what he was trying to do and to as many people as trying to deliver the product to and the investors he was trying to make whole, it was a failure. Like he just described it that way. Yeah. So okay. it's kind of it's kind of funny. And so I have to, you know, I look at I look at um different my my different clicks and fans and and other things. And there's ways in which books are like throwing spaghetti at the wall. You know, you kind of there's so many people who touch the whole release strategy and everything else, but you look at Outlaws of Time over with Catherine Teagan books at HarperCollins and how those did, like those sold, you know, that's that's my least selling series. And has, yeah, it's got passionate fans. There's a bunch of people who really, really prefer it and mm -hmm. read it and reread that versus reading my other books, which is funny. Hmm. Um, but other people do that for the other series as well. Yeah. And so it's a it's it's amusing. It really is amusing to me. And so the Ashtown fans are Ashtown fans, and yeah, those books did. I had to learn a ton. So I, I could talk about all sorts of failures and war stories. And well, I was going to ask, do you have a project where you're like, yeah, that? I mean, I, I assume you you I know run that evaluation on every level, but do you have yeah. one where you're like, yeah, that failed Woodlawn level? <laughs> yeah, I'd say, I think the closest would be uh, the Outlaws of Time series, and there's a lot of reasons why. Yeah. Um, and so when you try to break it up, you want to try to make sure that you're, some of them are just, 
it's there's a terrible happenstance, you know. So outlaws of time correlated yeah. with my brain tumor. Um, <laughs> that's that was that tough. was that was a big one. Um, but it also correlated with the woke. Uh, a lot of the woke brigade appropriation people were getting, you know, librarians were getting protection money from authors to actually like certify sensitivity uh, on on books, and I refused to pay. Uh, publisher was really nervous about it. I wouldn't pay three grand to this um native librarian to give it a stamp of sensitivity approval um you know like there's there's things like that um that are that are in that are in play uh the first one as it was coming out there was a big fervor people were outraged that i was using uh, uh manuelito especially as a character they were like he's a total cliche a white cliche and i was like no he's a real guy here's his picture yeah he's a real i wanted to name him after this particular navajo chieftain who's named manuelito who looked like this this is his hat i described him right i did like this is yeah you know like i actually just took a historical character but that was all there's this big like steamroller of woke cancel culture that was starting right when i was right you know releasing my you know worst possible series for that and then J.K. Rowling like rode to the rescue, publishing a short story about Navajo skinwalkers, and everybody was like, "Bigger game!" And they just chased her. And so I had a pretty successful launch mm -hmm. <laughs> with Outlaws. Nice. But I did, man. The the war stories, the failures. I would say every uh, every single book in my like in my Rolodex, like how I measure it, I would say every single book failed. Just because it didn't get where you thought it and was, that, where you wanted to Meaning get it. that as I look at them, I only measure the failure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, You're glutton. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, I, I only think about, okay, what could it have done? How did we not do that? Yeah. What could it have done? How did we not do that? Where were the, you know, where, where were the routes and angles? And, mm. um, and it's not to say I'm not grateful. I'm extremely grateful for how well a lot of the books have sold for earning out advances. You know, I didn't know for a long time how rare that is. <laughs> it's like, yeah, to successfully earn out yeah. my advances on my novels. You know, it's like those, those kinds of things. Um, so I, I really do kind of, I try to like measure the successes of like, okay, so we Ashtown was featured on NPR and coverage was on the today show. And like, I don't want to pretend like that didn't happen. Yeah. You know, I want to be grateful for those things, but I still think the most fruitful thing for me to hang on to are those ways in which we could have done them better ways in which that's, that's ways, a, ways in which way putting it yeah. so ways in which we could have released that book more effectively you know and and so on right you know and there's there's a lot of those yeah and so when i think about the books i don't think shiny gold medal i think how how we could have done it better mm. and there's a lot of those so and the war stories are amazing yeah so that's cool many that I, many of which i can't i can't uh i can't share but at some um, point in your tell all memoir yeah all this is off of reviews so but the reason why is because the review question mostly we get criticized for saying being too declarative so that i know we, that i'm not a seeker yes well i mean and i think the question the question i had this comes from jake he didn't want to be dragged into it is, but, it, is this is this because of somebody really likes a movie or a book and then i just well say well, something yeah. dogmatic about and, not liking it and what jake was saying he was like you guys should do an episode on why everyone has bad taste <laughs> and how you probably have bad taste like no listen, I don't. my not taste you. is perfect jake. listener come on you jake. Listener. <laughs> <laughs> he, this is why he told me not to bring him in He's like you don't need to credit me on this idea but the question is it does seem like everyone reads something and then evaluates so so black or white based on their own taste and in general, most people have terrible taste. <laughs> yes. And, and I'm wondering, is there a way that you can persuade someone of that? How do you get someone to realize you've got bad taste? You were raised on SpongeBob. I, I will say you were catechized with absolute schlock. Yeah. Um, like Jake was saying, you know, I grew up watching SpongeBob. And so it meant that I couldn't watch Westerns with my dad because I was like, what is this? The shots are slow nothing hokey. happens yeah it's hope yeah 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 and he he looks back on that saying you know if i'd had the ability to look at myself and say hey my taste was bad right it's not that the westerns were bad 
So I, I recently just Jake, if I did that wrong, too bad. I, I actually just plugged in um, a two kids at home, sixteen year old son, thirteen year old daughter. We we're gonna watch a movie over the weekend, and they wanted to see an action film. So I set the filters on John Wick, and I was like, "Why not?" <laughs> number one or number four? One. Number four. One. Just came Force out, right? in theaters, yeah. <laughs> and so we watched again Vid Angel. We watched VidAngel. I really should be getting sponsorship money from VidAngel or from ClearPlay. Well, we sent everybody to filter Slumdog, and there is no filter available. That was funny. I, did I say filter Slumdog? I think so. Yeah. I think what you should do with Slumdog is you should just watch it like a grown-up, see the whole thing, and then um, decide with your own discretion which of your family members get to be in the room. That's so do, do your own research. But the film, if you are a grown-up, you should watch the film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the uh anyways john wick anyway john wick so i i watched john wick and i i remembered all my prejudices and all i'd seen it once when it first came out and just i struggled with it um and it really i was really curious how my kids were going to respond and how they're going to process it and it was hilarious because at the end my daughter was like well she's like i mean that was fun popcorn Mm -hmm. And my son surprised me by just being like, no, it wasn't. <laughs> it was like, and this made me really happy. So my, my teenage son was the one who was like, blah. Yeah. 70. John Wick 70 should be like. headshots. And yeah. No, he, he and his, lines of dialogue. And he and said, he's like, that was not a story. I didn't care. That was like watching somebody else play a video game. And all the narrative structure and all the narrative choices were just video game structure and video game choices. Yeah. That's and I was like, very true. Okay, from the opening domino of the dead dog, yeah, you know, and, the, 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 and uh, all the way through. So he was just like, oh my gosh, there's four <laughs> of these, and that's which really killed me because he should be the biggest, like his testosterone teenage boy should have been the most like hurrah, yeah, you know, super violent action film. I'm getting right. to watch. This is great, killing people in really interesting ways. Yeah, and the thing is. The reason why my daughter liked it, but still called it, she's like, it's really kind of just dark popcorn, is what she said. Uh, the reason why she liked it is because she loves dogs. And so she felt, she felt his, oh, his okay. rage. He, <laughs> the motivation. She felt his Samson rage to tear it all down a yeah. little more than okay. my, my son loves dogs too, but she felt it. At she a got it right. Deeper on. sentimentality. Yeah, okay. But all this to say is like taste, how you calibrate taste. We've talked about this before, but you have to calibrate your taste off of scripture ultimately. Mm -hmm. and off of the storytelling of god and so the way you the best thing you can do is check your taste not against like oh some but some person with more sophisticated taste than you have although that can be helpful but to check your taste against god's taste and yep. that's where you know how out of whack you are and then the question of how you came to be out of whack is a different question. Maybe it was SpongeBob. Maybe it was MTV. Maybe it was you know reality shows. Well, I've been maybe aware of social that. media now. I mean, I've been aware of that with my kids because they've watched a good amount of Ninjago. Well, I've told them mm. this is a popcorn show, but I also have told them like, hey, this character arc of find your true potential yeah. is crap. Like, <laughs> so in that sense, I think it, you know. Yeah, and there's a certain amount where you're like, you watch it and like, is this too many? Doritos. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Where I'm saying, you know, and this idea often, of like, yeah. oh, the only thing each character needs is that moment where they uncover their true potential and become right. the beautiful butterfly they meant to yeah, be. Yeah, when our kids were little, we loved Charlie and Lola and Backyardigans. Yeah. Backyardigans was fantastic because Backyardigans was a show that successfully made the kids run outside and play, which was always yeah, you know, good. But um it anyway, I think that when you read scripture and you find yourself not liking characters that God likes or mm -hmm. not liking stories that God likes, um, then you have work to do. Yeah. You have work to do on your, on your taste. And the same thing is true in the natural world. You know, if you find critters and creatures and yeah. uh, weather, yeah, uh, we have, we have a weird, weather system right now here in early april and <laughs> yeah but i think somebody shared a meme i don't remember the exact words but it said basically if you lose your joy over snow you have less joy in the same amount of snow 
<laughs> that was like that right there. That is that is astute. Yeah. So if God sees fit to fling a big winter storm system at you right when you're like, yes, right finally, when you're like Easter, it's here. vitamin D and Easter, and you're like, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> it's and there's there's another one, like, can you actually follow God's aesthetic lead, or can it, you yeah. imitate Him the and follow heat, His aesthetic lead? The heat of your rage does not melt the snow, <laughs> right? Um, can you do that? And so with historic, like with history with scriptural characters, with the natural world, what you see in natural revelation. Um, well, what I found really interesting is actually people, um, they put a patina <laughs> over it all. And it's actually kind of hard to get down to to read the story the way that it really is or study the creatures yeah. that aren't just... Yep. Like y- you got to watch a real nature doc because tigers aren't all cute like the no. cub, you know? No, or tigers, they going to kill you. Yeah, or the baby caribou doesn't always get away. We were just watching Planet Earth. Yeah. Um, and and the wolf just wolf needed to eat. Yep. And the baby caribou ran the wrong way. <laughs> yes. Bad decisions. <laughs> Bad decisions. Um, um so you kind of do have to dig past the and I and I guess I'm seeing this my my son's reading Exodus now and asking a lot of questions about the plagues. And yep. I and I think you're you're right. Is yep. if I just told him the story, I'd be tempted to summarize in a way that skips a lot of yeah details. And yet you want to actually calibrate with God's narratives and your taste to align with God's taste. And I think most of us are way out of whack. And I think Jake's point's valid. And we're more calibrated to whatever we consumed when we were little. Our souls are calibrated to the soul food we were fed. And so the instincts can be completely broken yeah uh, you know all all the way broken and so we don't like david we can't stand samson you know we don't understand yeah what samson could possibly have been doing or the book uh, of job is something we don't right we don't quite we don't want to embrace right like the book of job is a tough one and instead yeah. of as an adult man working through it and thinking all right 40 yeah. chapters in here 42 yep it's for me what is going on? <laughs> but I, and let me, let me say here, this is even simpler. And I, I mentioned this with snow, the number of people who complain about the weather mm. blows my mind mm. that they just made it. They make it part of their day. Part of their routine yeah. is to complain about the thing that they are receiving most directly from the hand of God. Like they would never complain that frequently. I hope about local restaurants coffee shops they wouldn't drive through starbucks every single day and complain about the coffee every single day but keep on doing it Mm. and instead they have a relationship with god he's giving them weather every single day and they're going to complain about it every single day and it blows my mind because so let's let's start at like the top of the eye chart or the easiest point of taste calibration you have a you know multi quadrillion dollar set outside your door you know it's like we have this burning ball of fire in the sky we've got the glowing rock in the sky at night we've got the winds the trees everything else we've got this crazy balance of weather you know the earth is tipped exactly on a razor blade to refract heat from the sun even though we're closer to the sun in the winter months in the northern hemisphere it's a more direct angle in the atmosphere like sheds more of the energy so it's colder and then we you know it's like we we change uh so we're closer but angled you know it's like we get to summertime at least in the northern hemisphere and that changes we get more heat but we're on this teetering balance perfect razor blade balance where we actually get these ridiculous six-pointed crystals out of every single water droplet all winter and they're all crazily designed and unique and then but it's just it's still not cold enough to kill us all dead it's just right on this line where it's going to make all the decor, all the decoration, the you know, the absolute cabillions upon cabillions of these of these ice yeah. crystals. And then we're not dead though. We didn't freeze solid. You know, somehow we came that close to death. We're all that close to death. <laughs> Smash cut to me <clears throat> and, and my sandals in the backyard with Scout being like, oh, okay. yeah, <laughs> yes, complaining about all the snow crystals as it gets into my sandals. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, and then the angle of the earth changes you know, our relationship to this burning ball of fire in the sky is slightly shifted. I mean, just slightly. Yeah. Such that the temperature goes up. And now what happens? 
Well, now <laughs> we sunburn. <laughs> it's like there's like sun <laughs> sunburn and freckles and skin cancer and all this other stuff. <laughs> and it's you know, it's like we we do this and we're just but we're not burning alive. Yeah. We're not burning alive even in yeah. you know, Phoenix in the summertime, you know, when the crayons you drop can melt in the driveway. I mean, I step I love stepping out of the car and just standing there in 119 degrees, 120 degrees and just feeling that, feeling like how intensely alive you are. But I feel the same way when I step out and it's negative 15 and I can freeze my nostrils shut. So if you can inhale a nice sharp nostril breath and your nostrils contract and then freeze, like just freeze shut. <laughs> like that, I have the same I have the same kind of feeling to 119 as I do to that. Yeah. But we're in this spectrum, right? And neither of which are so intense that they're just going to kill us dead unless we get stuck outside in it and can't find shade. If you get stuck outside in Arizona, you can't find, you're dead. You get stuck outside here today. You get stuck outside here in April in Idaho. You, it could just kill you dead. Yeah. But it's just right on the edge of we, we're surviving just fine and God's balanced it perfectly. But we have a quadrillion dollar set out of our front door every single day. God set the backdrop for the scenes. I've, I've said before, you get to write your own dialogue. You get to write your own scenes. A huge part of that is this enormous set and the set goes on like it's so intricate there's no like visual effects shortcuts <laughs> this <laughs> the set actually retreats you know billions of miles that's how deep this set runs it includes all the stars and the galaxies and everything else and it also shrinks down into the ants in your sidewalk crack into the bacteria into the you know the toe fungus under your nail you know, it's like <laughs> it shrinks all the way down and it goes all the way up. So God gives you this crazy quadrillion dollar set and you walk out your front door and you're just like, ah. <laughs> it's like, it's like suck. <laughs> you know, it's like one star do not recommend. <laughs> it's like, God's reading your reviews. Yeah. Do you think God cares? Does, 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 does God care about your reviews? Um, and it was funny, we're, we then want the range to be slightly smaller. So we have our yeah. both AC, we switch. I always laugh at how quickly I feel like switching from heat to AC. Oh, gosh. Right? You know, it's like coming like next month all no, of a sudden. No, no, next, the end of this week. Yeah. Like we have, we have like 58 degrees in Idaho and you're coming out of snow. Yeah. I feel like kids are in shorts and flip flops and people yeah. are like, I'm so hot. <laughs> and <laughs> like, inside we're like punching the AC. Yeah. It's like, I'm too hot. I got to open the windows. It's like, this is ridiculous. The sun is going to kill us. <laughs> like we're gonna, as we come out of this. But the thing that's so funny about this is people might not like this TV show. They might like that, not like that movie. They might not like how dogmatic, uh, Nate is. I am <laughs> about a film or about, you know, a TV show, whatever. But I will be at my most dogmatic when I'm telling you when you step outside your front door in the morning, grow the hell up. Like, yeah, just grow up. And it's a good word. You don't, you don't get to step outside and kibitz and complain about this insane world and reality you've been given and the level of miracle that it took to build this set for this moment, for this day. So that you can complain, you know, so that you can, you know, you can fuss about it. That's not the dialogue you're the di supposed to that's bring. That's bad dialogue. And your negative review that you just filed on God's work, I can tell you 100% guaranteed is out of alignment with his taste. So, you know, if I tell you Slumdog Millionaire is a fantastic film and you're like, nah, -uh, like you're too dogmatic, you know, <laughs> like. Okay, whatever. We can have a conversation. I can unpack it. Eventually, you'll see the light. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, or maybe I'll just shake the dust off my sandals yeah, and move on. you have bad taste. That's the name yeah. of this episode. <laughs> yeah. But the, the point is, the thing, like, I, I can say what I want about a movie. We can disagree and wrangle. But the thing that is absolutely certain is your taste in days, in weather, in in wind in Creations, creatures in creature. creation in the things god loves and gave to you your taste in that in people we yeah. do that with people a yes lot. yeah it's like it you have got to match his taste in order in order to have good taste the standard of good is him so good taste means that you agree with god 
about these people in your life, about weather, about ants, about spiders, about yeah. termites, about fungus, about slime mold and gray whales and everything else. It's so like, here's, a, here's a question. Ned Flanders, right, from The Simpsons? Yeah. This doesn't mean, does that mean we're all supposed to be some kind of like smiling Ned Flanders? You know, <laughs> who's, you know, I think sometimes people hear your approach to that and they think, well, what, do I just have to like everything? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, I would I would boil it down to this, and these are these are my own words, which I have coined. Rejoice in the Lord always. <laughs> mm. uh, again, I say rejoice. <laughs> mm. I mean, it's not me saying that you have to have joy in everything. It's like, but you you do. This is actually like, not you being dogmatic. Yeah. This is I'm being dogmatic. This is only on. only as I am passing that word along. I am not the one who said that. It's not by my authority that I said that. That is a, a hot character tip. You want to know how God wants his characters to behave? It's like read the epistles, read Proverbs, read Ecclesiastes, read Job. Like, how does he want his characters to behave? Read Samuel and and have God tell you, yeah, this guy. This guy right here, he's a man after my own heart. Man, that guy. I really feel that guy. And you're like, um. As he hews Agag to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As, yeah, exactly. What it, Samuel did, what, what God wanted. You look at David uh, and you think about how many people have problems with David. Um, and yet God saying like, yeah, that's my guy right there. And here's the interesting thing too, though. I feel like we don't even push ourselves at all. Like, like how, how many of the average person watches anything or reads anything they don't really immediately like or something they know? I mean, I think most people say, you say, hey, have you read the Iliad or the Odyssey? Right. Th they would say, no way. And you couldn't get them to do it. Right. But they still want to then move into the literature sphere and say, no, no, no. I read this thing and this is good stuff. This is the thing. But, but. Yeah then you look at the whole swath of published history and they haven't read Greeks. They haven't read Russians. They haven't read, you know, and not that these are let's, all good. Let's make this even more demeaning. Oh, well, yeah, let's say what that, we wanted. Yeah. Let's say that you really love the architecture of manufactured homes. Oh yeah. And, and then you say, I love architecture. I'm really into architecture. I'm a mobile home guy. I'm big into architecture. <laughs> you know, especially the kind that comes on the back of a truck and gets dropped off. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's, yeah, that's the kind. If now, you can't move it, it's bad. That, yeah. <laughs> and let me go ahead and say, nothing against manufactured homes. They are a blessing for people who need them. I've spent much of my life <laughs> in one. Yes. Brian is a, is a child of, I think you were not even in a manufactured home. You were in a fully mobile home. Oh, well, you? That's what I say. You want it to be very mobile or you can yeah. get away from the things that are chasing you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's the gypsy traveler, and you? yeah, um, yeah. So, if somebody says, "I really like this architecture, this manufactured home architecture," and I say, "Why?" and they're like, "Well, because my grandma had one. This is what I grew up. This is where the, it always smelled like apple pie and everything else." That's great. That's beautiful. But if you say, "This is the best architecture. This is the stuff I like," and I say, "You know, it's not." the high point of Western architecture. <laughs> we have to go back. Let's go back and, and let's actually go to the beginning of Western architecture when yeah. people are figuring out from the Greeks and the golden mean and all this other stuff. Is, yeah. And you're like, no, I don't want to read that. I don't want to look at that. Yeah. But you still want to have an opinion about architecture, but you're not willing to actually become informed in any way about where it came from or why. Yeah. What the reasons behind these ratios? And, yeah, you're trying to classical, you're trying to classical Vitruvius and in, in yeah and translation. You're like it's kind of boring. Yeah, <laughs> right. So people who have that kind of uh, those narrative instincts, the way they would respond to uh, a show or a movie or a particular genre of fiction or anything that they like to consume, and then to your point, but they have no desire to actually become acquainted, acquainted with Homer and Virgil and Beowulf and the history of yeah. where these kinds of stories came from. If they don't want to scratch any deeper than the Avengers and that's it, 
It's yeah. like, then they are in manufactured home architecture and they are the ones being dogmatic on behalf of their own taste. Right. But they are being kind of like stubbornly ignorant. Like they're going to maintain the darkness, the ignorance that enables them to remain fans of yeah. this. I cannot tell you how many people have, I've talked to uh, other writers and so on who will fight to protect ignorance if it allows them to continue to like something that they already like. They don't okay. want they don't want to gain more sophistication. They don't want to get wisdom and get a, a a better palette that would cause them to throw away something that they like. So, can you give a more specific example? Like Breaking Bad. Oh, okay. So, the thing about how many people that really affected and they really loved it. And then they they don't want to learn anything potentially that would cause them to not like that anymore because they're too fond of the sensation it gives them. And so then they start working to protect it. And so this is for anybody who works in communication, we've talked about this in our rhetoric episodes and communication, but people make their decisions emotionally and people make their aesthetic decisions primarily out of sympathy, uh, initial sympathy, dopamine, various dopamine triggers, um, wish fulfillment and so on. But each person's a little different and how they respond to different things. But then you have something that's a smash hit hunger games, breaking bad. Um, and hunger games is another perfect example of how hard people would work to remain ignorant of things that would damage their affection for it. You know, they need to, yeah. they need to protect their affection. And so they will work. Now we're all human. And so we all have this instinct. We all have a reflexive affection for something. Uh, and in that reflexive affection, we then start to defend it and yeah. we use logic and we get out there and protect it. But we also can just keep a buffer zone of darkness. Like we are not going to yeah. uh, know better. So an example, if we're going to stay in architecture, somebody says they love Bauhaus architecture. Yeah. And you say, um, you know where that came from? Like, you know, that was a, it's evil. You know, you know that at that's that right there, Bauhaus architecture at the very front end says, Hail Satan. Mm. You are know, like, that's where it came from. You know, that Hail Satan at the beginning. Now, you've heard me here argue that uh, authorial intentions don't matter. <laughs> yeah. And they don't. There are some cool modern houses. There are some where I'm like, that's beautiful. And it's, you know, the, in, in its setting and other places, like this is actually a pretty great. Yeah. There's a little Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah. There's, there's some, and say, yeah, like, cool. this is nice. Yeah. You know, it's like, but the entire point of Bauhaus house and what Bauhaus house is trying to accomplish, go read it, go like start with from Bauhaus house to our house by Tom Wolf. Yeah. And just yeah. see how much they wanted you to get to, to know Walter Gropius, <laughs> get to yeah. know a guy named Gropius for goodness. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> This is, you know, remember we've talked before about God names people like on the nose, Anthony yeah. Weiner and um, uh, also AOC's last name is Cortez, which is fantastic. She's named after the imperialist conqueror and then she's on her woke high horse. But so there's all these little gems, but you have, uh, you got Anthony Weiner, you got Walter Gropius. Gropius founds this movement, the entire point of which is dehumanization. Yeah. Is a rebellion against the image of God and man. Are you comfortable? That's bad. Yes. That's basically his. Yeah. And trying to, are you, are you actually um, not a BB interchangeable in the machine? Like we want these, we want people to feel interchangeable and feel like cogs and so on. Uh, you read all that, you look at the architecture, you see where it came from. It affects immediately as it should, how you relate to it. But people who have a reflexive, like, I love that, I like that. And then you say, hey, let's turn the lights on and all this band of darkness that you've maintained that surrounds your affection for that thing. Let's actually become wise around it. Yeah. But hey, here's the bad news. When you become wise, you're going to stop liking this. Yeah. They, they will not turn the lights on. Hardcore. Yeah. And so this is an example, the most extreme, like if we're going to go to one of my dad's sermon examples. He said that, you know, people who have a sin, they're trying to protect, they have a little pet, they have a little hairy pet mm -hmm. and they're snuggling with it and they're stroking it and they love it. And they're, they're stuck in the darkness and this is their, you know, they'll call him George and right. you know, it's like, and they're rubbing it. And then somebody turns the lights on 
and they see that it's this nasty little goblin, you know, or tarantula or something, just something grotesque that they've been snuggling with. And like, they hate you for turning the lights on rather than flinging the yeah. thing away. Yeah. Rather than like, Oh, and just thank you and throwing it. Yeah. They want to protect their affection for it. And they, in order to protect their affection for it, they have to maintain ignorance. And so yeah. turn the lights back off. Yeah. Get those back off. And they yell at you for doing that. And there's a lot, there's a lot like that. So all think, of the freaking believe in yourself, Disney stuff. Yeah. All of like rom-com literature. I think music is like that too. People oh, really happen to listen to film music until yep. you say, Hey, did you know what that song is about? Let's read they'll those say, lyrics. Shall they'll, we? They'll say, no, 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 no. Yeah. I just like the hook. I like the beat. Yeah. Um, please keep the lights off mm. in any way that will cause me to mature in my aesthetic judgment. <laughs> like, yeah. and so, Things like Hunger Games, things like Breaking Bad. High School Brian, really into spy thrillers. You know, <laughs> yes. you know yeah. and you look back on it and think, oh, what is that? There's nothing wrong with spy thrillers. I know. Yeah. I know. Maybe I, the I, ones you liked. <laughs> I mean, there's not, but you when you read it exclusively, it's one of those moments. Yeah, where yeah, you yeah. Look back and say, oh, that was a taste thing I was I sh- doing. Uh, yeah. I was uh, eat, pounding popsicles just every day. I was going to the, the convenience store to grab myself a hostess cupcake. <laughs> exactly. And I needed it. And nothing else was good. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I think that I think that we do that a lot, mm-hmm. and it's also weird because I could be, you know, obviously I can be completely wrong about stuff, but it is really difficult, and I, I think disingenuous to pretend like you don't know something. So, you know, if yeah. if we're driving down a road together. And I start taking a left because I know this is how we get somewhere. And people are like, why are you doing that? We need to, let's wrestle with this. Let's grapple with it. I think we could go right. I'm like, actually, this is the road. I grew up here. I do this. This is, this is my native country. This is mm. where I have my expertise. This is where I have spent all my time studying and training and working. And I know these roads. For me to be like, you, you know what? Let's have a committee meeting. Like, yeah. let's actually think through, let's, let's weigh all the options and let's think through it and let's wrestle, let's grapple. When you just, you, that's the way, like that's, yeah. that's the road. It's really difficult to pull that back, to pretend like you don't know something. And so if we had a podcast about math and I was talking about, um, you know, I was talking about the Pythagorean theorem or I was talking about Euclid or something like that and the early proofs. Yeah. People would be okay with me being dogmatic. No, a pl- a squared plus b squared yeah. does equal does. c squared. It really equals c squared, and they they wouldn't even think of it as dogmatic. Yeah, like they do, they wouldn't occur to them that that was dogmatism. When I say something about a show that someone likes or a movie that someone likes, they have affection for it. They have emotional attachment to it. Then that that's when it's suddenly they're a relativist. Suddenly yeah, we need, we so suddenly we need relativism. We need a band of blackness where we have ignorance and relativism. And I don't have to, you know, you might be wrong about this. It's like I'm yeah. So that I'm, means we really bought the fact value distinction. The, yeah, the idea that a realm of values is separated from true and false. Right, and we the beauty is really in this eye of a beholder situation right. now checking your work is more difficult. So if you hear me dismiss something and you think, oh, I think you're missing it, I'm going to argue for it. I've heard from so many people about Breaking Bad on and Hunger Games uh, on that front. Then you're like, you know what? I'm sending something in to convince him that he's wrong. You know, yeah, I could be wrong. There's things I could be wrong about plenty of times. Uh, But when you are working in the world of narrative and art and aesthetic judgment, in order to really have an informed opinion, you do need to know the history of that actual, uh, you know, thing, thing, that, that actual area, you know, the history of it, you know, the history of discussions about it, you know, what different artists thought about it forever, you know, the history of three act structure, you know, the history, of, you know, where it all came from, what it's built on, uh, and, and so on. And you also, more importantly, no scripture, you know, the taste of God, you are familiar with God and you know him and you know him to a point where you're actually like you would be with your father, uh, because he is your father, pretty confident in your ability to gauge his taste. 
Oh, my dad wouldn't like that. My dad wouldn't. No, my dad would hate that. My dad would love that. Yeah. If you if your relationship with God is grounded in getting to know him, like getting to know the personhood of God and really knowing God and working towards that and working towards that through study of his creation and his word and his and stories he's told in history and so on, studying the proverbs and knowing where he blesses, where he curses, and seeing that with characters play out both in scripture and in history, but also looking at his love for roly polies and aphids and ants and beetles and you know, and all these things, you get to know your father. Then you get to a place where it's not that difficult for you to say, yeah, my dad would hate that. My dad would love that. That's, you know, that's something he would really care for. Um, I would give the, I would give him this for Christmas. <laughs> you know, it's like this is he would he would like it yeah. and so ultimately the question with breaking bad hunger games any other aesthetic judgment is the question of would your dad like it mm. like what would your father say um yeah and we have more that we could study about our father that would tell us his taste than we have about our earthly dads and our father in heaven is so much bigger. Right. There's so much more. That's what I'm know. saying. There's just a vast, yeah. vast, like there's, we could study the, the handiwork of, you know, God, the father for, you know, an infinite number of lifetimes and not get there. You know, it's like, we could just end to end us and we would not fully and completely have, we would not have exhausted mm-hmm. what there is to know about him. There's so much to get to know. Um, and you think about our earthly dads, there's very little, you know, it's like, there's very little to work with very limited, limited time, little, and we get to such a, such a strong opinion about what they would like and what they would not like. It'd be pretty easy. Uh, but you can keep getting to know God, the father better and better and better and better for the rest of your life. And there's so much to work with such that ultimately when people want to tell me no wolf of wall street is great, uh, for a Christian to tell me that. They need to be telling me, I think God loves it. Like, I think God the Father loves that. And to which I would say, you are incorrect. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, just, yeah. you're wrong. I, I know him, and that's not true. You know, I've had, I actually had, have had some pretty hilarious, because my dad is a controversial, hardcore, you know, lumberjack pastor that that people love to get out as a campfire tale yeah the nyt Um, quote right there more of a lumberjack than a pastor (laughs) um i have had the privilege of more than once walking by a conversation in some other state around the other side of the country that's about my father and i have joined these conversations (laughs) when i've had the opportunity (laughs) with without identifying myself and listened to people try to represent what my dad thinks or plans or is scheming uh, from Maryland or from you know New York or wherever we are. And I hear him and, and I start responding and I say, yeah, I really don't think he would have said that. That's not something he would have said. That's not something he thinks. That's not something he likes. No way Doug Wilson thinks that. And the, watching them challenge me like the the challenge of like, well, I heard him say this and that. And the other it's like, you know, I know him pretty well. That's not something he would say. That's not something he would do. Not something he would like. And there's been these various moments, these light switch moments. People in the group recognize me or start to realize who I am, and the speaker still doesn't. And there's been all these awkward, amazing <laughs> scenes that I've gotten that I've gotten to be part of. But ultimately, when it comes down to, it, it's like you know, he's my dad. I know him way better than you do and he didn't say that i know he didn't say that i know for example one of them in maryland was uh that he wanted to be a pope yeah i know no it's not (laughs) (laughs) not in his not in his plans um isn't the just isn't the case (laughs) and that's and it's 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 pretty funny and there was a, there was also a hilarious moment. A buddy of mine got on a Michael Moore bugaboo train about the Bush family and international conspiracies and, uh, you know, the Illuminati, yada yada, like that level. And almost providentially, weirdly, I got invited to go do some literacy work in the state of Florida with the Bush family. 
And I was like, yeah, okay. So I go. And I arrive and it's a weird moment. It's Jeb's birthday. And I get grabbed uh, by one of the sweetest women I've ever known, Barbara Bush. And she drags me to a birthday luncheon for her son that's like just really small group. And we, we're in this closed small thing and I'm at Jeb, I'm sitting next to Jeb and he's got a birthday cake and it's like his family and I don't know why I'm here. It's like, and so, <laughs> Weird. yeah, and it's, and so I'm, I'm here and we have lots of conversations and I have a big argument with Jeb about the Shroud of Turin and we're at, like, there's all sorts of stuff going on and, and we're, we're discussing uh, philosophical principles, principles behind political beliefs and all these other things. Lots of just raucous, fun, small table arguments. And Laura and Barbara were just hilarious uh, and, and fantastic, like fantastically sweet people. And there was all these formal things that we're going to go do the next day and stuff and events and other things. But this was like this really informal, like weird moment where I was like the one outsider that they just very hospitably dragged into this family event. Um, after which I was like, this is not the Illuminati. <laughs> this is, whatever that was whatever that was that was not a cabal that's ruling the world <laughs> this was some very sweet southern women that was a texas birthday party yeah i got dragged into a texas birthday party i sang happy birthday to jeb boy well, you know it's this is weird um and then fought with him about the shroud of turin um but it's like when you get to a place where you you kind of like experience something it's it's harder to believe things your opinions change and so i think that our goal for the goal for all of us should be to continue to push to a closer and closer relationship and familiarity with our father in heaven with you know jesus christ the word you know the word who was with god and was god it's like the one who bought us like with the we just need to push and push and push into a closer and closer familiarity yeah such that realizing that you have a stronger instinct for god's taste is not a bizarre dogmatism it comes from a familial relationship it comes from a proximity it comes from a closeness it comes from having really studied his work mm. you know so when if i'm going to fight about william shakespeare with somebody and they have one paragraph of shakespeare that they really like and they just read over and over again and i've read all of shakespeare and i'm saying no i think he would like this not that and they're still trying to be in the fight. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So, well, I mean, this this W. H. Auden had a great observation where he said, "You have the taste of a child if you think good and bad are our options. The yeah. options are good and I like it, good and I don't like it, I don't know, and then also bad and I like it, bad and I don't like it. Right. And until you can do that tree of five options, you're a child. Yeah. If you think it's good and bad, you're a child. And so, if you if you have. Uh, a son who wants to put a gerbil in a microwave, like you shouldn't have any problem dropping the hammer with a God hates that. Yeah. And it doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. Right. It doesn't say don't microwave your sister's pet gerbil, <laughs> <laughs> but you should have no trouble extrapolating <laughs> from what you do know it says and from the personality of God to hammering your son to become more like Christ in how he loves and exists. Oh, uh, my kids for a long time thought that acid, like acid was a particular term and it one word too, not just Sid, but acid, like <laughs> acid meant somebody who was destructive for pleasure and that, that they couldn't be that, that everybody knew that word. And that was a thing like through elementary school. And it's because from toy story, there's Sid who would just destroy toys for fun and put them together. And he was a villain and he would like to burn them and so on. Um, and we would always tell our kids, don't be a Sid. Like, don't be a Sid. And they they knew what it meant, but they like, and they knew where we they knew they now. knew where we got it originally when we first watched Toy Story and we started re, you know calling back to it. But then as they grew up and we kept saying, don't be a Sid, it became just a Sid. Uh, it's the one word and not a name and not a Toy Story <laughs> reference and so on. But we ingrained in our kids like, if you can step over it, you don't step on a beetle, you don't step on an ant, you don't step on the handiwork of God for no reason. If you do, cause you're walking down the sidewalk and it just happens, you don't feel guilty either. You know, it's like, right. cause he, he's the one who, right. Who told the story. You're like the tornado in Oklahoma, you know, like you walk, you walk through, but if you see it and you don't have to, you don't, if you don't have to destroy, 
why would you just destroy? Right. Just just for pleasure. What is what does he love? So all this to say, circling all the way back, two callbacks. One is knowledge can sound awfully dogmatic. If you disagree, like by all means, send in a message. We'd love to have a discussion. Still try to make Nate cry with our review. Yeah, but you need to do it from a position of knowledge, from a position of knowing God, knowing God's taste, knowing story, knowing those things, and then disagree. By all means, disagree. We'll all get better Yeah. Uh, through having done that. And then calibrate your taste starting at the shallow end of the pool, which means get over yourself and your own comfort and receive those things that are coming directly from God, like the weather, with joy. Like just, you know, no matter how hard, especially when it's hard, like receive these things with joy and the laughter. Receive hardship with rejoicing in the struggle. Like rejoice in the struggles. Receive trials with joy. Receive anything from God with joy. Become more like him in your tastes. Become more like him in your aesthetic instincts. And that's how you overwhelm all those SpongeBob catechisms that you got when you were a kid, like because you're becoming more and more like the one who made everything, and you're going to be as you do. You're going to become more and more confident in your aesthetic judgments the more you get to know God. I mean, that's just the case. And I'll be totally wrong about stuff. And so the you know this is this is hard. I'm not an inspired prophet of film criticism, but there'll be places for us to fight over those things but the the point of appeal needs to be shared needs to be mutual the appeal is always going to be to the taste of god right when I mean, that's where the appeal is going to go when we disagree and i could absolutely another child of god could convince me no actually our our father would would like this or wouldn't like this thing that you say you like or 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 whatever uh but that's the standard that's the standard that we have to go to in dispute Great. There That's we go. Wrap. More more one star reviews, please. So <laughs> Brian can read them and I can be shocked to discover that reviews exist of podcasts. I didn't we can get over a thousand. I didn't know. I didn't know that was a thousand. thing. So uh, that's been that's one hundred and noonth. Yeah. That's a lot of episodes. Yeah. We, we should, should stop. <laughs> Isn't that the end? Yeah. The <laughs> end. <laughs>